Hello, everybody. Okay, so thanks so much for joining. Uh, we'll we'll get stuck straight in because otherwise we always run out of time with these. So I'll run through the introductions so we don't forget anything. So uh, good morning and a very warm welcome to this Explain Pain in the Clinic. Thank you for registering and thank you for joining live. Those people that are here. My name is Joanna and I am director of Noi in Europe and I'm joined this morning by Tim who is principal instructor for Noi and also my very good friend of about 20 years. <laughs> Gets longer doesn't it Tim with every year that passes <laughs> that we're doing these. We so look Tim has... exactly the same we haven't aged. Not not at all. <laughs> it's unbelievable like I've got no more wrinkles. You do, you do and... look always the same yeah yeah you've got exactly the same amount of hair <laughs> <laughs> honestly True. even if you look back at this from you know a year ago we do look a bit different sorry to tell you but <laughs> anyway we still have fun so that's what matters um okay so just back to the introduction so tim is an active clinician himself he specializes in complex and persistent pain he is also founder of an organization called La Pub Scientifique, which is an online platform for clinicians to learn about the latest developments in clinical practice and pain research directly from the uh, pain researchers and the specialists. And Tim will drop the link to that into the chat. They also have a brilliant podcast. So uh, get yourself onto the website and check that out. It's really, really good. Different guests every two weeks. Um, he is also also co-author of the Graded Motor Imagery Handbook with David Butler and Lorimer Mosley. So these sessions, uh, these Explain Pain in the Clinic sessions are all about giving you a taste of Explain Pain and how to practically use it in the clinic. Now, some of you will have already done an Explain Pain course. Some of you come week, you know, every time we do one of these. And so for you guys, this, these sessions are designed to reinforce what you've already learned and expand a little bit on what was covered in the course but if you're new to explain pain and you haven't done a course then these sessions act as a brilliant introduction to what it's all about so just a couple of things to mention before we start tim will be talking for about 20 minutes if you do have any questions please pop them in the q a or the chat and um we'll we'll be monitoring both those feeds uh, if you want to watch the recording of this session, you can watch it in two places. There is the NOI, the Facebook NOI Clinical Discussion Group. It's a really great group and we put loads of bits of information in there and there's contributions and people put questions in there and that's a great group to be part of. And we also uh, put the, the live stream of these into that group. And then there is the clinical discussion YouTube channel where we store all these uh, past recordings and there's a whole library of different topics that you can access there. So I'll drop the links to those into the chat in just a minute when Tim kicks off. So uh, today we are talking about if the current medical model uh, for helping people with chronic pain is effective and Tim will look at the limitations and look at some new perspectives on uh, chronic pain that may lead to more effective management and how explain pain uh, sits around all of those ideas. So Tim, should we kick off with um, a little bit about what the current medical model is? Or perhaps you'd like to get, sorry, I've, I've got to, gone too fast, haven't I? Do you wanna tell us what you're gonna be talking about? <laughs> um, yeah, um, well, I, I've just got this plan in my mind, which is, um, yeah, to say a little bit about the medical model, um, what that means to to our, us, our patients, societally, um, even perhaps how systems are set up, um, which will give us a flavour to understand the relationship that that has with long term conditions and um, people with long term or persistent pain. Um, and um, you, then I've got a few thoughts about what we could do about it. Um, so, so um, well, yeah, I, I mean, I'm not thinking that we can change things overnight, but I, I wonder whether we can start making some, I mean, I'm absolutely sure people joining here, many people are complete converts and you're wanting the same thing, but how can we set things up um, to be more successful 
not just for the person in pain, but for us and also from a societal point of view as well. So, yeah. Perfect. Mm. Okay. So, <laughs> off you let's, go. Uh, let's start. <laughs> well, the, I mean, it, it, I, I imagine this is fairly obvious for people, but I'll just um, sort of um, spell it out. But um, much of healthcare, current healthcare in a westernized setting is um, predicated f on a biomedical model. And a biomedical model is a, a sort of really intuitive um, model that is looking for a cause. Um, so, um, you know, if it was an infection, for instance, we've just been talking about that before coming on air, but uh, it would be brilliant if you could identify the, the bug, the bacteria, and then target that um, specific bug. Um, so awesome, great in an acute setting. Um, there are some issues with a biomedical model from a pain perspective. I suppose the obvious one is that it's quite reductionist. So, you know, looking for that one root cause, looking for that bacteria in that case that we've just given, um, does lose some of the richness of the individual, the complexity and um, what we know about um, people, human beings, is uh, we're, we're so much more than, um, you know, the, the anatomy, the physiology, etc. And, and we'll talk about that um, as we go on. And, and I suppose the first thing to say about that would be it's, it's interesting to consider the determinants of health. Um, because if we sort of come out and have a much wider perspective, um, things like the uh, economic status, um, mm. social situations, living, et cetera, housing, all have a bearing on health and well-being and, and the types of um, problems that someone might develop. So I feel like there's a, there's a sort of there's a there's a problem there, isn't there? Is a sort of disconnect between the, the biomedical model and then understanding um, sort of the global impact of health and well-being. Um, I just I, say, I, Tim, that I do actually think it's important sometimes that we do go back to basics on some of these things because I know a lot of our audience will be very very experienced, but I do also know that students are watching these and. Um, you know, and also anybody that's experienced some, we all need a reminder sometimes, don't we, mm. of, uh, you know, why we're doing what we're doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And for me, actually, because I, I enjoy, you know, spending a bit of time just thinking about what I'm thinking. Yeah. <laughs> why I'm bothering thinking this way as well. And yeah, um, exactly. you know, it's, yeah. it's helpful to reflect. Um, I like, and, and then I, I, I mean, I've really very, very uh, crudely sort of then another um, element that I feel is problematic in, in particularly relevant to pain is how dualistic a biomedical um, perspective can be. The split, typically dualism is splitting what in, something into two parts um and from a medical point of view or a pain point of view we typically talk about um body and mind um so um problem there's problems there in that well if you're not finding it in the body uh it must be in the mind or it must be mental and there are clearly um we've all heard about people being stigmatized, you know, mm. not being believed, um, and uh, and and that's that's that's. Although you might not understand it, you know, there's certain things that we can do, do that um, help to integrate a, a more holistic awareness around pain. So, um, so that's the the sort of sort of overarching. If we're saying a biomedical model, and that, now I'm that, that's not to say everybody is following that model, but I would argue that most uh, health systems are set up with that in mind, um, and therefore that's brilliant in an acute care situation. But it's uh, but it's is that effective or is that the best that we can do in longer term conditions and and my argument would be no it's not <laughs> obviously we sort of preempted that here and then and then i've got sort of a few different thoughts about the biomedical model and, and what that means to for instance the person in pain because 
the person in pain when they come to see you as a as a clinician um, dependent on their beliefs their understanding there are certain expectations relating to that as well um, and it might be that they are looking for that root cause or there there, there is a um uh, perhaps um, an expectation that someone else is going to do something for you you know there's going to be a medication to take or a specific intervention that can be done and and therefore it can be quite um, passive um, the the inclination that person has so more of an external locus control we would call call it um, so that's the sort of thinking about the, p the person in pain and, and we often hear that from people as well um, mm -hmm. they haven't found what's wrong yeah something like that and and it, and it gives you this flavor if you're listening well uh it gives you a flavor of the type of model that that person is using in order for them to understand their health their well-being and the pain that they're experiencing so mm -hmm. as a clinician it is helpful for us to have a sort of um flexible understanding and and one of the things we do in explain pain is is we're not just um um, belittling a particular model we want to recognize the strengths and the weaknesses because the people that you come to that come to see you will not always have the same belief and understanding and education as, as you will have had so it's helpful to be flexible in your in your um in your understanding so so that's that's one thing i mean from a clinician point of view it's it's also interesting as well because if you have been schooled like that, um, then it's not surprising that you would see your role differently. And, and if you're more of a biomedically inclined clinician, then it, it's typical for you to feel like you need to fix something. You need to look for that problem and fix it. And, and you, you probably will take onus of the problem as well, ownership over it. Um, and there's there's problems with that as well. And if we're looking at perhaps in an acute care situation, that might be really helpful in the longer term situation, then um, being the fixer oh, and there are problems there in when you are unable to fix. Uh, when the problem is more complex than that. Um, and, and so so. So I would say, you know, us and having that schooling, not everybody, um, because perhaps the newer generation coming through um, are actually a bit much more holistic and, and feel that, you know, being thinking about a more person centered approach is is, um, is more intuitive anyway. But, mm. and, then, and then and then and sort of thinking about societal and cultural and environmental um, influences as well. There's there's inevitable um, influences um from someone's family let's say um and whether or not they um recognize even or or understand or are able to help mm. and support that person in pain um the employer as well um and their role or not of supporting that person in uh, the ability to be able to resume work or, or maintain work um even with pain um even if we just come a little bit further out from that but you know local communities and the wider uh, influence of of your society um there are there are clearly then um inevitable um links with uh, what's offered what's available what support there is available etc um so um yeah so that that's so i'm just thinking about by bio, the biomedical model and the influences widely and and what that means mm -hmm. to us um so so i'm not saying there's no merit to a biomedical approach but from a long term perspective, mm. when we start looking at pain and we start looking at the determinants of health and we start looking at people who do well or don't do so well, then we see all these sort of flaws in thinking coming out um, and, and really revealing themselves. So, so I think it was a really interesting point that you made, actually, Tim, in that it is important to recognise the benefits of those models and not just see them as a, a negative. 
Yeah, and and look, whatever the next model is, if it's a biopsychosocial model, or if we're thinking about frameworks of understanding, if it's inactivism or predictive processing or where, wherever it goes to understand pain, um, the, no model's perfect. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, there's strengths and weaknesses to each, and and it's worth recognizing that. Um, so so and and then I I wanted to come back and and sort of see where explain pain situates us in this argument mm. and um one of the things that we hear uh, from patients so the lived experience of accessing healthcare of the um of the literal um contact that they have with healthcare clinicians um they often have um they often have quite negative experiences and and we hear these so often don't we joe um you know they and they even term it you know it's a battle to you know access healthcare and, and i'm thinking about a person last week and you know the involvement of um litigation and like the battle with the lawyers and whether or not they're actually releasing funds to access healthcare and i mean mm -hmm. it's just and the impact that that then has on my patient is that they are having that it is incredibly stressful experience um it's just accessing the 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 care that they they need and and, and want as well so um and 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 you could understand if someone is more biomedically inclined that where they might struggle if they're not finding something on a on a blood mm -hmm. test you know that they might struggle to reconcile what you know why is it that this person is experiencing pain at this time so so you can understand that perspective and but there would be simple things that we could do and and, and simple things that we can do is set up the you know the space right the environment right um build a relationship and a rapport and 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 listen to someone and validate their experiences even though you don't know what it might be like for them to go through this mm. you can you can do your best to understand what it is that they're experiencing so i feel like there's an awful lot that we can immediately do that completely relate to an explain pain approach um and and uh, <laughs> and how simple would that be how easy would that be um so mm. so that's that's the sort of the first thing that i'm thinking and then, and then there's a sort of i don't know i don't, i'm thinking about it in that moment of of the experience with that person is um is that there is for some people you are a diagnostician you're being asked to label this person and diagnose what it is that's going on and there are problems with diagnoses even so you know depending on the model that you use you're more inclined to use specific diagnoses like an arth you know this is an arthritic problem or you have degeneration or, or you have a disc bulge and and what we now are starting to unpick with that is that for certain people not everybody but for certain people when they hear that diagnosis it can be actually um, really um, unhelpful mm. so it can lead to negative thinking um, avoidance behaviors um, and um, it might be a predictor of chronicity as well so so there's like in the moment things that if you do it really well and you're mindful of mm. you you might not take away all the bad but you are you can set up a better um environment for or, you know your ongoing interaction and, and and contact that you have with that person i think that there's just two things to say here tim first of all that you you touched on a, a few different points there um about the explain pain approach and um we have gone into a lot of depth about a lot of those things in other ones of these webinars so you can uh, cross-reference what tim has just been talking about into the other webinars and listen to those uh, i think you know things like listening and um validating someone's experience we've done sessions on those sorts of things so uh, we, we haven't got time obviously today to go into a lot of depth about that um, no. But there's a very timely comment here is I think it's a comment rather than a question really from Miriam and she says um, I still find it hard to determine when a pain condition chronic 
when it is recurrent and especially in people with multiple problems when it's mixed and even in classical acute pain say after the oper after an operation the way patients see their body and their beliefs influence their healing so much so i use a lot of pain education on my acute patients as well yeah yeah um yeah great uh, 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 what we don't know hugely is is what pain education might be best to to look like in an acute situation but but yeah, but but you know everything that we're saying here about communication validation building rapport etc is i'm sure miriam Miriam does this already but um you, you know is absolutely you is what you'd want isn't it if you went to someone you went to your doctor your dentist your physio whoever it might be you'd want them to to be a human being so yeah um um I think within that question, it, it is hard for some people if there are recurrent problems. And I'm being a bit careful because I'm saying um, long term or persisting. And, and, you know, even if it is something that waxes and wanes, then that is clearly something that is persisting and, that is, and is a long term problem. So mm. we, we do yeah. see that. We do definitely see that. Okay. Um, Sorry to interrupt your flow there, Tim. You were. <laughs> You were going <laughs> in a direction and I've interrupted Yeah, you. well, I, I mean, I'm just mindful of time and I wanted to, I've got like about yeah. more points to go through, so. Okay, go, <laughs> speak, um, talk no, it's in. okay. <laughs> uh, um, so, but uh, um, where are we? We've sort of been in the moment. Now, the, the other thing, and we have talked about this, but um, that the, we need to recognize the importance of our own health and well-being in order to be able to support others. And, and there is a risk, and we're hearing this quite a lot, aren't we, Joe, of people who are, are exhibiting burnout, signs of burnout. Um, I think, actually, if we're really brutally honest, we probably see this a lot with our patients as well. You know, they're, they are fighting they are battling on all fronts i'm using their words as well you know the patients that i'm seeing they're having to hold down a job you look after their family you know there are constraints and, and pressures etc coming from a number of places and there's only so much we can we can take aren't there before mm. before you your body just says uh -uh, you know listen up uh, you need to be nice to me um and, and I feel like there's a there's a need for us to recognize our role in the relationship and, and our need to be healthy in that relationship as well, so that we can offer the most for the people that we're seeing. So mm -hmm. um, a shift from that feeling that we need to fix every problem. And we've the phrase that we've used in the past is to note to become more a facilitator in health mm -hmm. and well being actually is a for me it's been a quite a liberating um shift and change um um and if someone can recognize the importance of that as well and, and that does take a little bit of educating around it depending on their stance and their and their thoughts and their model that they currently use that that might take a little bit of work together um mm. to shift and 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 just thinking about like coming out and, and 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 being a bit sort of bigger picture and the ot's have been doing this for years so apologies any occupational therapist are listening but is recognizing the importance outside of that um that clinical situation so we mentioned about the family and and understanding whether or not you even whether they, the family know you're in pain and 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 if they do is it something that they can help you with do they help you with how do you know what's the relationship that's going on in the household um can be massive can't it and and then and then i didn't see morton ho um popping up murray uh, mentioned but um, um but the role that employers have in the um in the recovery phase as well and from a sport perspective it makes sense doesn't it that you've got this sort of graded return to activity and performance and, and eventually to to the game situation and mm. and not all employers are at that point where they're willing to uh, work with the person and the clinician and giving them you know cr creating the right conditions so that they are going to come back to work successfully um 
I've got a, another example of a patient I've been working with for a long period of time. She's building up from being bed bound and she can now do nine hours of work in a week, which we think is a phenomenal change. But um, looking at the employment strategies and, and the other people uh, involved is they're like, well, if you can do nine hours, why can't you do full time? And, and so that's the belief and the understanding mm. needs to shift and it needs to change from a societal point of view as well. Um, and if we sort of uh, come out further, further than that, because a lot of people are, you can probably see population health strategies going on regularly in the UK. They're happening at the moment, aren't they, Joe? Um, mm. Where the there is more recognition in what we can do in order for us to maintain health and well-being you know instead of waiting for the problem to develop why not set up the conditions so that you are healthier longer into life and we've talked about the difference between health span and lifespan and and acute medicine is brilliant at prolonging lifespan uh it's not so well set up to uh, mm. increase health span and health span for those not afraid with that is is the 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 length of time that you are able to engage in life in a healthy way so doing what you want to do for as long as possible uh, and there are some you, you know some some i think some better knowledge being disseminated around things like um nutrition food choice um uh movement exercise activity even you hear about things like sleep uh, the obvious ones i guess would be um smoking and drinking and and what have you but we're starting to see more lifestyle change population wide health strategies and and it's important to recognize how important those are in the ongoing um, um, a delivery of, of really effective and high quality care for people with long-term pain problems. Mm. Yeah. So a there's a lot there, Tim. <laughs> and I just said, I have, there's, a, so there's a question from somebody in the audience. And I also just wanted to say to Marie, you asked about a session called um, From Fixer for, to Facilitator. And I am pretty sure we've done that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just going to look for it and see if I can find it. But I'm pretty sure, Tim, we did a session called from fixer to facilitator. We did. We did a coaching session with Richmond. Oh, was that it with La Pub? Yeah. yeah. Ah, OK, well, thanks, Marie. We could um, that that might be our next session. Who knows? But we're, Tim and I will make a note of that. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think it was a coaching session with Richmond too. Okay, um, so just quickly before we wrap up here, Tim, can we just answer Kath's um, question in the um, Q&A? Is there any section of NICE NHS that looks at a situation as pain is the current problem? We haven't found a cause of pain, but we still will still treat the pain as a thing to deal with. I honestly don't know. Uh, is there any section of nice NHS that looks at a situation as pain as the current problem? We haven't found a cause. I, Kath, I honestly don't know. I'd have to look at the guidelines and, and I haven't worked in the NHS for 10, 15, 15 years, 15 years now. So I don't know. There'll be people much better positioned to understand what the position of the NHS would be. Um, and it's not like um, one of the things that I do do is I get to talk to many, many different people working in different um, settings and within different systems. And what we find in the UK in the NHS is there are some phenomenally well set up systems and uh, integrated departments that are doing exactly what I'm talking about here uh, wonderfully well. And then we have others that are so under resourced funded. Um, and they are really struggling as well. And, and we hear from those departments and the people working in them. Um, so yeah, it, it's kind of weird, isn't it? This massive organization and it's very fragmented and disparate in terms of what is available geographically. Um, that, that didn't answer your question. <laughs> 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 but, yeah, I know we've talked about this before, but there are, you know, there are sort of departmental level approaches but equally the importance of individual level bringing this knowledge into departments yeah 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 
Yeah. Yeah. And, and okay. I think there's, Can, like, there's, sorry. Oh, I know we're going, we're running out of time, but I was going to sort of run through some really simple recommendations, which would be like the person in pain is a human being, like treat them as that, you know, be person centered, individual, build the rapport, validate, think about your communication. He, then there are things like, you know, if it's a long term condition, thinking about how services are delivered from a, t a temporal point of view. In other words, like time is a feature in recovery. And if you are only allocated a six week period that you can work with someone, is that going to be effective for a long term condition? Um, if you work with someone for six months and then you're being told, I'm afraid you've done your six sessions, you've got to finish now and, and move on. Is that going to be like, are they just going to come back into the system? So systems, systems need to also evaluate whether they uh, can be can be better designed to help people with long term conditions, uh, which they can be for some other long term conditions that's absolutely set up the clinician. Uh, even their thinking, their understanding, the models that they use, being more flexible with it, I think will help. But be, be like spending some time on yourself. And not if you work in a team, recognizing where you can support others as well within the team, I think is really, really important. Um, and then there, then there are big like people are doing projects on this, but there are big population wide um, strategies that I feel. Um, would be really, really helpful. And the one I'm going to like one, not a moan, but people joining a session like this are we are preaching to the converted. And the and the, the, the thing is, and I have these friends, uh, the thing is that this isn't necessarily the way that everybody is thinking. And, and you know, there are a lot of people there. I'm speaking to a really good friend of mine last week who is off work at the moment. He's unwell. He's clearly got signs of burnout um and he hasn't had the support he's but he is quite biomedically oriented and and mm. um doesn't recognize you know and being f f fair to him like that like that we need to boost the level and understanding of everybody around us um mm. <laughs> tim we're gonna have to stop because we've gone yeah. five minutes over yeah but i yeah. Did, i i get you i get you completely with that we do we do feel like everybody knows this stuff and you and I are guilty of this too. I think we said there's an assumption that people in our community think, you know, that they know what we're talking about. But we get so many new people on these sessions. It is so important to keep to keep talking about it, to keep going over the, and over and over the same stuff, because it's really hard to actually implement becoming a facilitator from being a fixer, unless you're completely unless you're really comfortable with it. But those methods and the uh, you're being reminded of it constantly. So I think just to wrap up there, Tim, if anybody on this call has not done an explain pain course <laughs> with Tim, if you want to know how to do this stuff, if you want to know how to become a facilitator, not a fixer, and to take that into a, into your work as a private clinician or into a department where you feel like you might be swimming against the tide, Tim is your man. He'll help you learn how to do that um he's got a couple of courses coming up he's got a uh one starting on the 22nd of february which is uh, i think four sessions uh three hours each uh that's you do that over the pace of two, uh space of two weeks you have a chance to learn from him go away implement some of it come back ask him questions and these sessions here are designed to support you beyond the course we are not just we are not um we we don't believe in just training people and then shutting the door and saying, see you later. That's what this is all about. It's about ongoing, continued support. So if you want to do an Explain Pain course with Tim, 22nd of February is his next one. And then beyond that, there will be another spring school coming up, which is a 10 week program. Same, same form, same content, longer period. Okay, guys, I'm sorry, we've run right over today. We probably maybe bit off a little bit more than we could chew, <laughs> but it was great. And thanks so much for joining. And um, we'll see you again in a couple of weeks. We'll just decide on what we're going to do next time. Okay, cheers, guys. Thanks so much. Take cheers. care.